Greetings, Alpha Citizens. This week, Rock Sonar and the First Sun open the Underwater Temple, while John Maldif reopens his restaurant, and Captain Stupendous battles no mark over the city. I'm Craig Allen, and this is Alpha City News. Rock Sonar, leader of the Fearless Frogmen and the first son of Poseidon, have announced that they have together rid the recently discovered temple found underwater off the coast of Alpha City of all the aquatic security robots which had been preventing investigation. Appearing to be of at least semi-Atlantean design, the temple had been protected by fearsome mechanical constructs mimicking the local wildlife which had even managed to capture Frogman Frenchy Montaigne when it was first discovered. The Frogman, who came upon the temple almost a year ago, had held off exploring it so as to allow Atlantis to take part in the endeavor. Working with the Atlantean hero known as the First Sun, the Frogman have been not so much exploring the interior of the temple, but moving through it in an attempt to discover and neutralize the various traps and systems that protect it so that a team of scientists could begin the long process of investigation in safety. The Atlantean representative to the League of Nations, Jana Ball, is reported to be quite happy with the job done by the Frogmen and the First Sun, and is apparently hoping to secure the Frogmen's assistance in the recovery of other lost Atlantean artifacts. What information has been released about the temple has excited scholars who specialize in the time in prehistory when the Atlanteans first appeared, as the artistic motifs of the temple seem to point to it being built by Atlantean precursors that were amphibian and not yet fully aquatic. While some have feared that this revelation, if proved true, could cause unrest due to Atlantean religious tracts seeming to claim that land-based humans came from the water-based Atlanteans, researchers at Eisner University have been quoted as saying that the Atlantean priest historians regard these stories as being parable rather than exact truth and that the claim of land dwellers descending from Atlantis comes from how Atlantis preserved knowledge from being lost to the cataclysm that drove them underwater, much as the Muslim world saved the knowledge gained by Greece and Rome when Europe was lost in the Dark Ages. In any case, all parties involved seem both delighted and fascinated with the possibility of opening this lost era to modern scrutiny, as well as being happy that the first major effort, sponsored by both the League of Nations and Atlantis, has begun on such a hopeful note. A bit closer to home, the second opening of John Maldif and Barker Clowey's mushroom-centric eatery Basidiom took place last night, and it was even more of a star-studded affair than the first. Given that the city home garnered four-star reviews from its first night, the high-class turnout was to be expected. But even more people who had no interest or chance of being seated for the restaurant's return night were present, on the off chance that yet another supervillain incursion might occur, possibly from another of Maldives' former teammates, the Clockroach. For those who don't remember, John Maldif was formerly known as Toadstool John, the Mushroom Man, and he, along with partners the Subterranean and the Clockroach, caused more than their share of mayhem in the early 1980s. Maldif was captured, spent more than a decade in prison, and went straight upon his release, becoming a specialty mushroom cultivator earning more money supplying the culinary needs of Alpha City than he ever did as a supervillain, and with far fewer altercations with police and superheroes. Thinking that he had left his law-breaking past behind him, Maldif must have been as surprised as the rest of the city when Simon Stone, his former comrade known as the Subterranean, reappeared after more than 25 years, seeming to have a personal grudge against Maldif for having changed his ways. Though Stone both burned down the original Bessidi home and attempted to assault Maldif personally, John Maldif felt no rancor towards Stone, for reasons which were made clear when Stone and Maldif were married by the judge presiding over Stone's sentencing hearing. 
turning what could have been a very dark day into one of celebration. Some had hoped that Stone might make an appearance at the opening, but although not able to be there in person, his presence was felt when, just before the doors officially opened, four subterrans, the beings that the subterranean ruled, delivered a gift from Stone to Maldive, an obsidian sculpture intended to stand by the doorway mushroom-shaped and bearing the establishment's name in crimson stone, which seemed to be lit by internal fires. Maldive, visibly moved by the gift from his incarcerated husband, even tried to thank the subterrans, who seemed quite confused and vanished rather quickly. While covering the opening, intrepid reporter Lindy Johnston had a chance to speak with Sebastian If who informed her that he, along with the healer from Eisner University's Department of Super Medicine, would be making an expedition into the ailing structure, the living building. It was just a few weeks ago that structure battled the wrecking crew, stopping their attempt to destroy a building near the intersection of Bacon Street and Ether Avenue, but not without being damaged itself. Indeed, Structure spent most of a week blocking the intersection before it was helped to the vacant lot near the edge of town where it goes when dormant. Since then, Structure has seemed to be falling farther and farther into disrepair, with broken windows and cracks in its foundation failing to heal themselves, and a groaning sound as if it was slowly settling in on itself being heard by passers-by. To quote Sebastian F., well, Structure, the old fellow's in a frightful way, obvious to all. Dr. Escalapius, terribly intelligent fellow, has managed to determine that Structure's problems are mystical, spiritual if you will, which falls a bit outside the good doctor's purview. The bright man confesses himself quite baffled as well, but the healer feels that should he be able to reach the heart of Structure's uh, structure, it might be possible to render some sort of assistance, bring the old fellow back up to scratch if you will. He has asked me to lend him the use of my own meager abilities, and I, of course, agreed. One can't turn down the request to help a former brother in arms, what? And now a word from our sponsor, Captain Hoagie. At Captain Hoagie, we start the day asking one question. What went so wrong with my life that I'm an assistant manager at a sandwich factory? Come into one of our locations today to try our Incredi Cheese Wrap using four different kinds of cheese, American, Swiss, Emmentaler, and 1980s Reagan-era government welfare cheese food product number nine, aged to perfection in a government warehouse where it sat for 35 years after being misplaced and forgotten. Captain Hoagie, where dining is a dismal reminder that your life and dreams are slowly becoming ever less bright. Captain Hoagie, 10 locations around Alpha City. The Conundrum Corporation. While investigating an island that seemed to appear out of nowhere on the South Seas, found themselves facing one of their oldest enemies. Asked by the government of Tonga to investigate the beautiful island, which had been appearing and disappearing from various places and luring natives to try and swim to it by what seemed to be an irresistible music, The five conundrites headed south in their flying wing this past week, flying reconnaissance over the beautiful Tonga Island until they spotted the lushly wooded, mountainous mystery island appearing with their own eyes. Finding a clearing on the outskirts of a lake near the center of the island, the question mark heroes landed their vehicle and split into two groups. Master pilot J.T. Chance and genius engineer Iron Irv Fishbein stayed with the wing to scan the island with its advanced sensors, while Lance Logan, Chet Maddox, and the lovely Evangeline Decane set out to investigate the island's flora and fauna. What seemed like a straightforward case of a vanishing island quickly turned strange, though, when the sensors on the conundrum flying wing went dead. J.T. and Iron Irv left the wing to investigate and found themselves ensnared in traps set by the very Tonganese they had been sent to find, lashed to poles, and carried into the jungle. Meanwhile, the three scouring the wilderness spotted the conundrum emergency flare, shaped like a question mark, and fired by J.T. Chance as he was being captured and headed back to the landing site, 
only to find themselves face to face with and then running from the king of dinosaurs himself, the legendary Tyrannosaurus Rex. The three, pursued by one of nature's deadliest animals, had no choice but to take refuge in a mountain cave. Searching for another exit, Logan, Maddox, and Decane instead found what looked like a room carved out of the living rock itself, including a sealed door. As they investigated the door, a solid steel wall descended behind them, cutting off all escape, and before they had even a chance to begin planning their next move, gas filled the chamber, rendering them unconscious. A long darkness followed, but when it receded, the three sleeping heroes found themselves joined with Chance and Fishbine, although their reunion was sobered by the fact that all five questionauts were secured, hand and foot, to five chairs arranged in a semicircle around a desk, behind which sat their oldest enemy, Toberta, self-proclaimed enemy of all mankind. Toberta, creator of myriad plots to bring the entire world under his control, had created a device which allowed him to sway the minds of the unwary, ensnaring them and bending their wills to Toberta's design. It seemed as though the unscrewers of the inscrutable had provided Toberta with the means of realizing his vision of world mastery at last as the sensors from the conundrum flying wing were exactly what he needed to extend his mind control machine's influence over the entire world. Or this would have been so had the Cryptic Five not come prepared. At the same time, each activated their secret overload devices, causing their manacles to release them, the feedback from which caused Toberta's machine to overheat and catch fire. As the five made their way out of their enemy's control room, their last sight of Toberta was the villain rushing forward, attempting to stop the overload, only to be caught in a massive explosion. Racing to their flying wing, the Conundrum Corporation took once again to the sky, only to see the Mystery Island vanish one final time. Peace in Midtown was shattered on Wednesday as Captain Stupendous appeared over the city, locked in mortal combat with the Nomark. The Nomark is an alternate version of the Captain himself, pulled from a possible timeline where Rama Ultra, the Atomic Pharaoh, rules the world with the power of the enslaved Captain on his side. The Captain and Nomark pounded each other furiously, trading blows that could be heard for miles, moving at speeds that defied the ability of the human eye to follow them. The Nomark, however, could not seem to best the Captain, no matter how hard he struck or how fast he moved, and his constant need to taunt the Captain may, indeed, have been the small edge the Captain needed to defeat him. Catching the Nomark a resounding blow to the chin, the captain struck again and again, driving his double down and further down. The furious battle ended only when the captain stood over the insensate Nomark in a small crater caused by the force of the captain's blows near the middle of Kirby Park. Intrepid reporter Lindy Johnston raced to the center of the park, hoping to be the first to get a quote out of the captain about the battle to stop the Atomic Pharaoh, which he and Empyrean had been engaged in in the distant past. But as she arrived, both the Captain and the Nomark vanished, leaving only the fallen trees and torn up earth. But before Lindy could leave the scene, another lost hero made an appearance. Johnny Munson, almost unrecognizable, seeming to be years older than the boy who had left Earth mere weeks ago to report on the battle taking place in the far reaches of the universe between the Neo-Deities and the Anti-Gods, told Lindy that he had come from an apocalyptic future, caused by Johnny himself. The last report we had from Johnny showed him activating the Revelation Engine, an artifact of unspeakable power left over from the universe which existed before ours, and which had fallen into the clutches of Abraxas, the form destroyer, the leader of the anti-gods. Johnny had told the engine to destroy itself to keep Abraxas from using it to control the universe, but when the engine tried to do so, it shattered, 
with pieces of it landing all over creation. According to this aged Johnny Munson, Captain Stupendous was crucial to reassembling the Revelation engine, which would allow the future from which this Johnny had come to be averted. This was all Johnny had time to tell our intrepid reporter before he was forced to leap through time and space again, continuing his quest. We here at ACN hope that Johnny travels safely and succeeds in his mission to save us all. This has been Alpha City News with Craig Allen, produced and written by Carter Lee. Sound beds were provided by Acidus. We're on the Rhymes with Geek Network if you want to check them out. If you feel like uh, asking questions, giving comments, or suggestions, we're at alphacitynews at gmail.com. Adios. Adios.